BMW mass airflow fault codes can be tricky to diagnose on late model engines and even more so on turbocharged diesel engines. The DME or DDE monitors multiple inputs when testing air mass to determine if the input values are correct. Oftentimes, mass air kilogram per hour data stream values look incorrect, but are normal. This results in replaced hot film mass sensors that did not require replacing and a fault code that returns. In this video, we're going to look at what values are normal and how to test the sensors involved in determining the correct air mass volume. Our subject vehicle today is a BMW X5 F Series with a 3 liter N57 diesel engine. This vehicle has multiple air mass faults stored and the mass airflow sensor has been previously replaced, which did not remedy the faults. During our diagnostic process, we found carbon buildup and we'll show you how we did that and where we found it. Our subject vehicle had fault codes for air mass volume too low and air mass volume too high. For these fault codes to set, similar parameters are monitored with slight variances for the specific fault. In our diagnostic test plan, we will combine the tests into one plan in a specific order to determine the root cause of the fault codes. We'll step through the tests one at a time. If you discover an issue, remedy the issue before continuing to the next step. Let's get started. On early model N57 engines, the air filter was updated. This would be from model year 2011. Remove the air filter and inspect the fleece on the filter. Gray colored fleece was replaced with a thinner white colored fleece. Confirm the vehicle you are working on has a white fleece. Next, inspect the intake air ducts before the turbocharger for leaks. Air filter housing, intake silencer, and the air ducts. Next, we have to inspect the EGR components. Begin by inspecting the EGR recirculation valve. We need to confirm correct sealing as well as the ability to open and close immediately. We can do this using our iScan diagnostic software in the DDE engine data stream. Navigate to exhaust gas recirculation valve position PIDs for position and nominal. You can also add engine RPM and EGR temp. With the key on and the engine off, I normally see about minus 10% on both. With the engine at idle, expect to see about 25 to 60% on both PIDs depending on engine inputs. During a test drive, at a steady cruise, they should mirror each other closely. During an acceleration and deceleration test drive, the position PIDs should drop as soon as it's commanded. Any delay could be from a sticking valve. Next, check for a leak in the EGR plumbing and connections. The flex pipe can crack. The EGR pipe to the intake can melt the intake elbow. Check for any signs of overheating in this area. The final test for the EGR is to check for carbon buildup. You can remove the intake elbow and inspect the cooler fins for carbon. In this example video, there is major carbon buildup and the cooler had to be replaced. This video shows what a clean EGR cooler should look like, no to minimal carbon buildup. Next, we have to test the exhaust pressure sensor before the turbocharger. BMW states an issue here should be accompanied by a fault for the exhaust pressure sensor before the turbocharger. However, I don't see these faults when problems are found here. To test the exhaust back pressure sensor, using our iScan diagnostic software in the DDE engine data stream, locate the PID for exhaust gas pressure before the turbocharger and charge air pressure. It's also helpful to monitor engine RPM and atmospheric pressure at the same time. With the key on, engine off, the value should match atmospheric pressure. You can compare the ambient pressure sensor value to the exhaust pressure value. In our example, ambient pressure is just about 991 millibars and exhaust pressure is 14.6 psi. Both values match for our altitude for atmospheric pressure. Working at the turbocharger geometry lever, remove the circlip and remove the lever from the actuator. This will allow you to manually operate the turbocharger geometry. Be careful not to lose the circlip when removing and installing. 
idle the engine and graph RPM, ambient pressure sensor, charge air pressure, and exhaust pressure before the turbocharger. At idle, operate the turbocharger variable geometry on, that's down with the arm, and move the lever back up. Repeat this three times. Exhaust pressure should rise to about 20 PSI with the lever down, and with the lever up, it should be about 15 PSI. Charging pressure will also rise and drop. In this example, charging pressure was 1,000 millibars. Raise the idle to 2,000 RPM. Operate the turbocharger variable geometry again three times. Exhaust pressure should rise to about 25 PSI with the lever down, and with the lever up, it should be about 15 PSI. Charging pressure will also rise and drop. In this example, charging pressure was 1,200 millibars. When you move the lever back up, pressure should immediately drop. If it does not, there could be a restriction in the steel line. This is normally carbon buildup. Inspect the steel line for carbon buildup. This is another one of the common areas for these fault codes. If you find buildup, replace the line, hose, and sensor. This is what we found faulty with our subject vehicle, carbon inside the steel line. It was not allowing built up pressure to drop fast enough. Next, we'll test the charge air pressure sensor. With the key on and the engine off, monitor engine RPM, charging pressure, and charging pressure nominal value. These should be similar. On our subject vehicle, they are all just about ambient pressure. Actual charging pressure and nominal match. Now graph these values and perform a test drive. Charging pressure and nominal should closely mirror each other. If they don't, you could have a leak in the charge air pressure ducts or a malfunctioning turbocharger. If you do see a difference, be sure the scaling on your graphs match before condemning your sensor. Now we're moving on to the charge air temperature sensor. This one's quite simple. You can compare your ambient temperature to charge air temperature with the key on and the engine off on a cold engine. They should be within a few degrees of each other, but will vary due to installation location. Idle the engine until it reaches 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Turn the engine off with the key on. Then start the engine and allow it to idle. The charge air and intake temp PID values should decrease similarly from the airflow. For a manual test, you can use the chart to compare temp against sensor resistance as well. To test MAF sensor signal deviation from the nominal value, we will test it at a few different engine RPMs. First, warm the engine. Graph engine RPM, air mass actual, and air mass nominal. I've added throttle angle also to even out my display. Raise the engine RPM to 2500 RPM for 10 seconds. Raise the engine RPM to 3500 for 10 seconds. Check the difference between actual and nominal at the two RPM ranges. No more than negative 12 to positive 12% deviation is allowed. The final step in the process is to check the intake valves for soot or carbon buildup. You can do a quick check for soot by raising and holding the engine RPM to 1500, then to 2500. If there are fluctuations in the engine RPM when holding steady, further inspection is needed. You can manually inspect for carbon by removing the intake elbow and looking for carbon using an inspection camera. Well, that completes our test plan for air mass faults. On our subject vehicle, we did find soot or carbon buildup in the steel line for the exhaust pressure sensor before the turbocharger. Carbon in this line can also lead to faults in the diesel particulate filter system because all of these DDE inputs work together to run the system self-tests. Thanks for watching. Check out our other videos for more technical tips on BMW vehicles.